I'm very happy to introduce our uh, speaker today, who's a friend and colleague, and uh, has come all the way from Maui to do this. So that's great testimony to his to his commitment. Um, Jeremiah Grossman is the founder and CTO of White Hat Security, where he's responsible for web security, R&D, and industry outreach. He's written dozens of articles, white papers, published author. This, uh, he's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, many other mainstream media. He's a well-known security expert and industry veteran. Uh, Grossman has been a guest speaker on five continents. That's everything that's not melting, I think, right? Including uh, Black Hat Briefings, RSA Sands, been invited guest lecturer at UC Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, and Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he serves on the advisory board of Risk IO and SD Elements. He was named uh, one of the InfoWorld's top 25 CTOs, and before founding White Hat, he was information security officer at Yahoo. But you don't have any gray hair. I don't understand why that's possible. Uh, I'm really happy Jeremiah is here. This is part of the Business Risk Forum, which is kind of a subset of the Scilab seminars. And uh, the idea is we invite uh, uh, somebody uh, who uh, from the operational uh, world in business and government because uh, uh, it's a the, the, the very different perspective. And it's vital that the academic research and the operational uh, environment uh, uh, have a dialogue because uh, uh, otherwise there's some very important lessons that uh, that get unlearned. So I'm really happy that Jeremiah is here and I'm going to turn you over to him. Good afternoon everybody. I'm uh, really excited to be here. How, how else do you get to get me to travel almost 5,000 miles from an island paradise? <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not a, away from you didn't cut my vacation short or anything. That's really where I live. Um, this is my daughter, Raina. It's her first trip with me. Um, thank you, Richard, for uh, having me and uh, Megan for taking such good care of me while I'm here. Uh, it, you know, it's interesting. I actually have a, uh, a connection to Carnegie uh, that I just thought about like 12 years ago. Or is that how long it's been? So when I first started at Yahoo, I was an information security officer. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But when I got there, uh, uh, Yahoo was getting slammed by spammers and different robots and things like that that are automatically registering accounts and sending out email and things like that. So we needed a system to be able to tell uh, what was a computer and what was a human. And actually the, the origins of the CAPTCHA were actually here, you guys, Carnegie Mellon is actually where the concept of the CAPTCHA came about, which was pretty interesting. Um, interesting stories happened there as, uh, you know, we put the CAPTCHA in place, a little squiggly words, uh, words and things like that, and then we got a uh, call from uh, from the American Disabilities Act saying we're discriminating against people with visual impairments. So we had to do the audio-based CAPTCHA and things like that. So I've been around uh, web security for a long, long time. Uh, mostly it's on the offense side, uh, offense informing defense, hacking websites nonstop, hacking websites, hacking proxies, hacking browsers. So this uh, title is not exactly accurate. I've been hacking websites for about 15 years, professionally for about 10. And what I do have is I have data on the last five years. So thousands and thousands of assessments across uh, the most important websites that are out there. You do have accounts in these systems that we get to get out of jail free card to hack. So. Um, we get to do things that uh, nobody really else can. So it's a pretty cool job. So in the meantime, I get to travel around and uh, go to conferences and things like that and share with people the things that I know. Um, so uh, Richard gave me a, a great bio, so I don't have to spend too much time doing this. And uh, yeah, so five continents so far. I get to go to Australia next month. And uh, so I'll uh, be one off from collecting the whole set, so I'm pretty jazzed about that. Um, about 10 years ago now, I started White Hat Security. The job I had at Yahoo was to literally hack each and every website that Yahoo had, roughly 600 in total. Yahoo also had 120 million uh, users, and that was a really big job because you have to somehow make, make certain that 120 million users play nice, and which was even more challenging because 1% of our user base was malicious in some way, which is not all that uncommon from the you find on Amazon or eBay or any other community or any of the, or any of the site. So, 1% of 120 million is obviously 1.2 million bad guys that didn't sleep between 2000 and 2002. Um, what I found there was that I, 
assessing website after website was taking me about 40 man hours of work per website. And at 600 websites, that was 11 and a half years of work. So unless I found a new way, some automation, or we're going to hire 20 people, that problem is not going to be solved. And we were going to be front page news. I did not want that to be me. So I talked to every expert I could find, every vendor. I read every book. And no one had anything that would scale to that volume at Yahoo, let alone everybody else on the planet that had a website. Since I wasn't going to get solved from where I was sitting, I started this particular company to set out to solve that particular problem. We knew websites had vulnerabilities in them. We just didn't know where. So I wanted to scale that out. Uh, flash forward 10 years, we have uh, over 400 customers from startups to the Fortune 500. We got we assess 1,000 websites, and we've been very fortunate to get a, a whole lot of uh, uh, press as a result of our work. So all the data I'm going to show you is from this last 10 years of experience. So as we go through, we're going to hit a lot of statistics, a lot of concepts. So if you have questions, by all means, ask. So that's one of the interesting things that I've learned in doing a lot of metrics-based work is every time you start trying to answer a question with a metric, you end up getting more questions. So why is all this web security or cloud rather important? Uh, everybody here uh, uses a browser. I bet you just about everybody here does banking online. Um, there's over 2 billion people connected to the internet. I bet you all of them use a browser, and a browser is just another way to connect to the web. We shop, we bank, we pay bills, we file taxes, share photos. I mean, there's basically nothing we don't do with a web browser these days and connect to the web. And these things that are part of modern life are being threatened by concepts such as cyber war, cyber crime, and hacktivism. Nation state sponsored, they are after the money, or they want to get a message out there. I'm not, I don't concern myself so much with their agendas. I do try to uh, concern myself with their methods a lot, a lot of their and their motivations, because it helps me uh, simulate what they do and also defend against them. But I don't, I don't go in much for the politics and behind them. But there are nation state sponsored attackers. There are those that are making hundreds of millions, if not billions. And there's those that are hacking uh, all sorts of things out there to get a message out there. So these things are happening. Now, how do breaches happen? I get this question a lot, you know, you know, how are the bad guys breaking into systems? And this is very easy to answer because we finally have data. And we've had this data for the last three years and more of it's coming out. And just about all of it is, uh, shares the same message. This was one year behind. So the Verizon's, Verizon Business 2010 Data Breach Investigations Report, these are the guys that go out and do incident response when a when a hacking attack happens, they, they send their army out, they try to figure out what happened, and they cobble all this data together and report. So that 2010 report reflects 2009 data, 2011 uh, report reflects 2010 data. So let's just go hit the first one real quick, and I'll read it verbatim. The majority of breaches and almost all the data stolen in, in 2009 were perpetrated by remote, organized criminal hacking uh, groups hacking servers and applications. That's code for web servers and web applications. For those that are techies in the room, that's port 80 and port 443. We knew that back in 2010, so we flash forward one year this year, uh, or I should say for the 2010 year. The number of web application breaches increased last year and made up nearly 40% of the overall attacks. Web application attacks, so all those Perl, Ruby, you know, Visual Basic and all those other things we put online. Those are the things that are getting attacked. So the breaches are, for the most part, web-based. It's not exclusively there, but when we're looking at the data losses and the things that cause us harm, that's where it, that's where it begins. All that, all that data that makes up those numbers was before all of these companies uh, had websites that were compromised. Um, these are pretty important companies, actually. Everybody from Oracle to the public broadcasting service, uh, Citigroup and so on. In the last year, 2011, each one of them had a, web, uh, a website hacked in some way that revealed some sort of information. Um, in the case of Citigroup, they lost millions because somebody was able to rotate numbers in a URL and was literally able to mine accounts, rotating it from, uh, literally 100 down to 99, and they were to hack these companies. Uh, so a lot of times it's not terribly sophisticated. It just takes somebody looking and know what they're looking at. I read a lot of reports, I read a lot of news, and a lot of it of the mainstream media news and the coverage on this stuff, and even the guidance that you see from the experts, I think is, is flatly wrong. Uh, and I like to go over some of these misconceptions here, and so as you re read them uh, in the news for yourselves, you, you shouldn't take it at face value. 
the first one, each and every one of these breaches that I've shown you here could it easily happen to anyone online. Nothing makes them special. None of them was particularly sophisticated. All these things were, for the most part, easy and using attacks that were more than a decade old. Um, exploitation of just one website vulnerability is enough to significantly disrupt online business, cause data loss, and customer confidence. That's the challenge. Websites are riddled with vulnerabilities, and it just takes one. That's the real problem. That's what I spend most of my day trying to figure out how to find that last one and make that last one not very meaningful from the attacker. The attack choice, the attack techniques of choice are things called SQL injection, PHP local file include or file include, and uh, password reuse, denial of service, and malware. Let's step through these real quick. So SQL injection, uh, by show of hands, how many have heard of this one? Okay, wow. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, SQL injection for the three hands that weren't uh, raised. Um, this way you can get direct database access right through the website. You basically just throw in a couple of meta characters and you can start mining data out of a database or injecting data into a database. It's uh, kind of the remote root of web hacking, if you will. PHP local file include. It's very similar to SQL injection the way it sets up, but it's more system le level access. You can actually perform system commands on the system. They use these two attacks. These two attacks get data or system level access, and the bad guys will extract data or insert data in the forms of malware. They'll download credit card numbers, you know, email addresses, messages, all sorts of things, including passwords. That leads into the, uh, to the third one, password reuse. Bad guys will hack one system, download a few million passwords on that system, and reuse those passwords on another system that they haven't hacked yet. Because uh, people do tend to use, uh, reuse the same passwords from website to website to website. Um, even if you choose a hard to guess password, these are the things that will happen. When they can't hack the website directly, they will down the site using denial of service. It's really trivial to do these days. You can buy a botnet for a few hundred bucks if you can't down it with something called Slow Loris. Or you use malware out there. You can target the end users or the systems in general. So all these are possible. One thing that the media constantly gets wrong, that every single speaker that you'll find at the RSA conference, every single one of the keynote speakers will never, ever touch this concept. The purchase of more firewalls and SSL will not solve this problem. Okay doesn't work. It doesn't happen. None of these attacks should be considered sophisticated by any modern standards. You all know SQL injection. I could teach anybody what SQL injection is and how to exploit it probably inside of two hours. SQL injection is a thing that uh, uh, I just read a, a news story that in the hacker forum, SQL injection and, P and the file include attacks are the ones that the hackers talk about most often. And you'll actually rarely find this discussion points in any of the developers, uh, developer rooms. Bad guys know this stuff. Uh, anybody know the first time SQL injection was ever referenced as far as an attack technique? How long ago what that was? I forget what the frack issue was. It was literally Christmas Day, 1998. Okay, we've been dealing with this one. We know how it works. What makes some of these breaches unique, or some of the victims unique, is that they are targeted. The bad guys know who they're after, such as, let's say, Sony, right? You know, they have a few hundred, few hundred websites, and the bad guys will just relentlessly go after them. I do not think Sony was any different than any other mainstream corporation. They could have just as easily targeted Citigroup or somebody or any one of the major banks, and the same results would happen. Maybe easier. Lastly, software will always have bugs and, by extension, security vulnerabilities. And I got this one from Michael Howard. A practical goal for a secure software development lifecycle should be to reduce, not necessarily eliminate, the number of vulnerabilities introduced and the severity of those that remain. We have to kind of backtrack our goal. We can't get to zero vulnerabilities. We have to kind of backtrack. So we have to kind of balance our efforts between secure software development and the resources required between what the bad guys are able to extract when they finally hack the system. These are the things that we should be learning, and we are learning them just at great pain. So uh, I get, uh, you know, as, as you might expect, I get a lot of companies that come to us or come to me directly, and they go, where do I begin? I don't want to be one of these headlines. And I said, well, the bad guy's going to do it, so you might want to hack yourself first. Um, know what the bad guys know or eventually will and then use that knowledge uh, to then further your, uh, further your security efforts. So I'm going to show you data on this stuff. The data that I'm going to show you is from something called White at Sentinel. This is what we do. This is our service. So I'm not going to uh, pitch you as a customer, but I just want to tell you the scale of the system. This data is from over 400 enterprises, from startups to the Fortune 500, over 4,500 4, sites assessed, 
we're processing nearly a uh, little over 357,000 vulnerabilities per day, some false positives, some not. We're doing over 7 million uh, tests a week for different types of vulnerabilities, 600 million requests per month, and we're literally storing about 10 terabytes of data per week. So, you know, Google has the, you know, how Google crawls the web, we crawl the on the authenticated web. We actually have accounts on the largest of the large banks. We crawl them and attack them. So these are our, our data. Uh, our IT guy informs me that we have 300 terabytes of, uh, of data rate available, and we're going to run out of it in about 100 days. So we hack all these sites, and what happens? This is the a average annual amount of new serious vulnerabilities that we find introduced per website per year. So we're assessing all these websites on a reoccurring basis, typically weekly. Let me define seriously, a little asterisk here. A serious vulnerability is a weakness that if exploited may lead to breach or data loss of the system, its data or its users. So these are the ones that make headline news. You can't be PCI compliant on any of these things. So any one of the logos, any one of these vulnerabilities that are in this set here, you will be, uh, your logo will be on the chart. So back in 2007, the average website that we were looking at had literally over 1,000 independent vulnerabilities per year. Think about that. I mean, any given day, you'll find one. Um, so let me, let me sh show you how we, how we count vulnerabilities. So imagine a URL, you know, something, something.login.asp. If, if we have uh, three parameters in there and two have SQL injection, we'll count that as two. So every, every vulnerable parameter, we count that as one vulnerability. Since we, can't, we don't know the exact code path that it flows through, SQL injection, that one parameter might go through another flow or another flow. So that's how we're counting in this case. 2008, 795, so it's going down. 2009, 480, 2010, 230, and 2011, 148. So we're getting better, and that's a really, really good sign. It's very rare for a security person to be able to ever tell you that things are getting better. Um, but it's still right around 10 vulnerabilities that we're finding per month on the average website. And these are the important ones. You don't pay us to test a site unless you really care about it. A lot of times we're asked to break it down by industry. In this case, we went a step further. I broke it down by industry and a singular year, last year. So last year, the average website in 2010 had uh, 230 average vulnerabilities. Uh, the banking sector did about the best. Actually, it's banking, healthcare, and manufacturing that are hovering about the 30s. So they had a, oh, what is that, about, how many vulnerabilities is that per year? About three vulnerabilities per month, is that right? Yeah. About three vulnerabilities per month that we have to find. And the ones that do not so good are financial services, retail, and telecommunications. The difference between financial services and banking, banking is the actual bank. Let's say you, you're more familiar with like B of A or Citigroup or Wells Fargo and things like that. But not all banks write their own software. They'll use financial services providers. They'll say, I need a commercial checking account system. So they go to an independent third party like an S1 or a Fiserv or something like that. That's them. It's, they're kind of like the ISP for banks in that sort of way. Um, so if you notice here, check this out. So you notice the big bubbles there, retail, financial services, and let's say Telecom, I actually noticed a real, something really interesting. I can't tell causality, only correlation. What I did see is banking is heavily regulated as far as info, InfoSec goes, so is healthcare. Not so much manufacturing, but those two that are heavily regulated from a government regulation standpoint do seem to do the best. The ones that are not so heavily regulated or industry regulated, such as retail, do far, far worse, like PCI, right? Payment card industry, data security standard, how many are familiar with this one? Okay. So those are the ones that were supposed to make credit card data safer. If it is, I can't see it. <laughs> All right. So uh, the only way that I can explain that number is that if retail websites change more often than banking websites, and they likely do, retail websites, it's always, you know, I have to get the uh, new code out by by Christmas or the day after, thank day after Thanksgiving. Banking websites are more waterfall development models, so they don't change that often. So it's almost like the point is life's not fair. They have an opportunity to shoot themselves in the foot more often. But this is the data that I see. Bad guys don't care how often you change their code. Bad guys just care to hack into it. Does that all make sense? Any questions here? OK. So uh, then I wanted to trend those numbers. So this is the annual. 
uh, average annual amount of new serious vulnerabilities introduced per website by industry by year. Now it's tough to derive meaning from a chart like this, but those are the industries that I'm tracking. Um, I have to have somewhat of a representative sample set. I, you know, I do have government and energy systems and uh, n nonprofits and things, but I don't have enough of them yet to include in the chart. These are the years and those are the number of issues. Um, overall, you can actually see the numbers starting to decline. This is a very welcome trend, so people are starting to figure it out and actually getting better at developing their software. So you can kind of notice it. Some are kind of bounce around, might be a little bit of anomalies, new websites added or things like that, but the general trend is going in the right direction. Um, you can also notice different correlations like social networking tends to be a bit better than, let's say, financial services. I have a theory there that I'm trying to prove out. I think that I, what a website is vulnerable to and how many vulnerabilities it has has more to do with when it was launched than the technology it used or even who developed it. And the reason I think that is is that you don't code against SQL injection or cross-site request forgery unless you both know about it and respect it. Knowledge and respect of an issue is tied to a date. You're not going to code against SQL injection until you first read about it and likely from the news. So after 2005, 2005 was the uh, era of the SAMI worm, the large MySpace cross-site scripting worm that hit MySpace. I think there's a break point. Anything before 2005 probably has a lot of cross-site scripting. Anything after is probably a lot less. SQL injection probably hit about 2007 with the mass SQL injection worms. And I'm still waiting for the break point on cross-site request forgery, we'll, but we'll get to that. And I'm going to try to prove or disprove my theory with the data. All right, so we did volumes. You know, how many vulnerabilities are out there? Uh, let's try to get a little bit deeper into what types of issues that we're dealing with out there, because this does tell us a lot about you know, where the development methodology is breaking down. This was actually a very unique year. 2010 was the time where cross-site scripting was no longer the most, pop, the most prevalent issue on the web as far as we're concerned. So the way to read this is 64% of the sites we tested in 2010 had at least one instance of information leakage or cross-site scripting. Uh, by show of hands, cross-site scripting? Okay, great, thank you. So cross-site scripting is those ones where you can get a, a, a vulnerable site to display JavaScript or a, untrusted JavaScript or HTML code and do some really nasty things. Information leakage is when a site gives up more information uh, than it should, such as verbose error messages, uh, internal database information, version numbers, and things like that. But it crossed over uh, by like a few hundredths or a few tenths of a percent. Information linkage is a little bit more vol voluminous in number of issues or in likelihood than it is than cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting is now technically number two from our, our data set. Then we have other ones like content spoofing, which is very similar to cross-site scripting, which just without the script part. Uh, cross-site request forgery. Uh, if you're fairly cross-site scripting, great you're going to also need to be familiar with cross-site request forgery. Just about every feature on every website is going to be vulnerable to this particular attack. It's not, it's not, it's, you can't even classify it as a vuln. It's kind of like an artifact in the way the web was designed to work. This is where I can force your browser to make a request that you didn't intend to make. So if you happen across my, bl happen across my blog after you logged into your bank and I force your browser to make a request to your bank to reset its password or wire transfer money, it will do it and uh, it will happily do it. This number is way, way low. It probably should be in the 80s. Um, but we're only uh, going after and identifying and reporting the most egregious issues. So it's kind of artificially low. It should be much higher. Uh, then you have things like uh, uh, SQL injection at 14%, insufficient auth at 15% in the red here. What you'll notice here, there's things that we call technical vulnerabilities, such as information leakage, cross-site scripting, cro uh, content spoofing, and SQL injection. Those are what we call technical vulnerabilities. More, they're errors of syntax. We send in a little bit of data, a little error message comes out, and we can kind of tell what those issues are from a purely automated fashion. All right, uh, so those are the issues we can find on a purely automated basis. The other half we could define as business logic or, how would I describe it? Uh, there's syntax or semantic issues where let's say, you know, in the case of like the Citibank one, we're rotating numbers, I can jump in from one account to another account to another account. There's lack of authorization. Things that we really can't find on an automated basis. So if you look at our top 10, there's half syntax and half uh, are syntactical in that nature. Just something interesting to observe about the data. Going further, 
uh, broken out a top seven by industry because I wanted to know if different industries are suffering from different types of issues. So here's the industries once again along the bottom and the likelihood again. So the way to read this is 43% of the banking websites we tested in 2010 had at least one instance of cross-site scripting. Um, let's see, 8% uh, of the manufacturing websites in the pink had uh, one instance of SQL injection. If you take a large step back, what we find in this data is that everybody seems to be suffering from, for the most part, the exact same issues. So it's a difference in degree rather than kind, which makes sense since everybody builds websites using the exact same technologies, the same languages, the same protocols, and the same web servers, same development methodologies. We all read the same books. So you wouldn't expect too much variations here by the industry, except one. There's actually one, uh, one interesting bit. Uh, that I found in this particular data. You see the banking sector there? You notice there's no pink? Um, it breaks off at 10. So the banking sector tends not to have SQL injection issues. I had to go double check the data. It's actually there. It's more like 6 or 7% when I checked the data. So technically, it's still some sites are still suffering from it, but not as much. I think the reason is there is that the, uh, the bad guys went after uh, the banking websites en masse going after SQL injection very, very hardcore. And through sheer force, the banking guys had to clean up the SQL injection issues where the other industries really haven't yet. So if you notice IT, right, it stops, the, uh, the, it stops at 25. So you know SQL injection is still there at an elevated rate. Um, financial services, it's still there as an industry average at 14. Uh, any, any questions here about this data? No, it's kind of a lot to, lot to digest and derive meaning from. One of my earlier reports, I want to say from a year ago, I try to see if there's some correlation between programming language and, uh, and outcomes as far as security goes. What I did find was that there isn't, wasn't a whole lot of variation between ASP Classic .NET, Perl PHP, and .NET. They all were within relative range. What I did find the differences between the languages are the .NET and Java languages, the ones that had more secure frameworks built around them, had, did have a noticeable uh, less number of issues uh, in the sites, so probably 20% less vulnerabilities. But what I found is in the Perl, PHP, and the non-framework languages, when issues were found, they were fixed more often and faster. I only had a theory on why, and my theory was is that uh, in the case of uh, uh, .NET and Java, since the framework did everything for the developer, when a SQL injection or cross-site scripting issue came up, they didn't know what it was or how to fix it. They never had to before. So that took them longer to go figure that out. And the Perl and PHP side uh, guys, since they had no protection since the very beginning, just about all of them had some vague notion of how to do input validation or output escaping. So when, I, so when White Hat get, said, hey, there's a vulnerability, they already knew how to do it. So that's the only way we could uh, rationalize that. But of course, there's no way for us to prove it. We only know outcomes. All right, so I wanted to see, these numbers are counted a little bit differently. This is more a collapsed counting, but I wanted to see if there is a, a trend between the types of vulnerabilities and over the years. Fortunately, it does look like these main issues, the ones that are really causing us a whole lot of heartburn, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, response splitting, uh, predictable resource location, abusive functionality, insufficient auth and XPath injection, it does seem like they're slowly declining in their, their overall numbers over time. So the average... <laughs> Jeez. We should have thrown another room. <laughs> All right. So the, uh, the top vulnerabilities, like in, uh, in 2007, 23 issues. In 2008, 11.9. Now, all the way so far in 2011, we're almost done with the year. These numbers aren't expected to change all that much. Uh, it's just about 10. So we're still just under one per month as far as cross-site scripting goes. So we're trying to rid the web of these things. But it looks like SQL injection is holding steady, unfortunately. It seems uh, since 2007, we knew about the issue. But it's hard. It's been it's been provably very hard to rid the issue of like completely across the range. All right, I get asked a lot about you know how do we measure how like actually this is the question that we get from customers a lot. How are we doing? And this this question can be taken in one of two ways. Uh, how are we doing? Are we getting better over time relative to ourselves, or an, or are we getting better, or how are we doing relative to our peers? 
And we can start answering those questions, but this is the one that I want to focus on here. The security posture of a website must take into account remediation rates and time to fix metrics, not just the volume of the vulnerabilities that you have. So this is where uh, I start combining all these things together. The number of issues you have, your remediation rates, and your time to fix. What we call a window of exposure. The number of days in a year, in this case 2010, you were exposed to at least one serious issue. We discussed what a, what a serious issue is. So at the top, if you look at the 44% there, 44% of the sites we tested in 2010 had at least one serious issue literally every single day of 2010. That's sobering, isn't it? Yeah, you've had a cross-site scripting on this day, you fixed it, but you, then you had a SQL injection the next one, and then you had something else the next one. If you count in the 24 and calculate those together, so 44 plus uh, 24 is 68% had vulnerabilities almost every single day of the year. So these are the important websites. So if you just start looking at the important websites, you're going to find a way to hack in or hack one of their users. What we also want to do is separate the, the, you know, the red and the orange is the bad from the light greens and the greens, which is the good. So we want to learn what the greens are doing and take uh, lessons from those guys and give it to the reds, whatever they are. So in the case of, let's say, the banking sector, right? You know, 16% of banks that we tested had at least one vulnerability every single day to 2010, but just over half did not. Just over half had a, one, a serious vulnerability less than 30 days of the year. So whatever those guys are doing, we want to learn. Right? That's basically what we want to do. These guys, they, maybe they didn't change their website all that often. Maybe they had very aggressive uh, QA, or maybe using a particular framework. Hard to say. Maybe they're using web application firewalls. But those are the guys that we want to learn from. Um, different industries do better. Uh, the educational sector doesn't do that good. <laughs> so uh, most of the websites uh, there were vulnerable most every single day of the year. Anything striking about any of these numbers? Any, any questions or comments on this, this one? You guys are really quiet. Yes? Well, a question about assistant uh, flight. Sure. Um, when you say if you keep it year by year, yep. uh, the bugs introduced, yep. that means a new bugs. Yes. OK. Then how about the general number of vulnerabilities you find each year? So suppose that the industry does not fix those button, bugs. So quick. everybody can hear that. Oh. Oh. Which one? Just this one. Uh, this one I'll repeat the question, Nora. Okay. So the, then that de depends on how fast the industry fix the bugs. Okay. So uh -huh. can you say the total number of bugs are declining or the total number of bugs that hold steady will even increase because you have new bugs? So, uh, uh, so a good question, my mistake for not clarifying. These are not industry bugs. These are unique to the organization. So this is, these are, the, when I say bugs or vulnerabilities, these are in the software that they wrote. These, these are not uh, issues with CVE numbers. You can't get a patch from Microsoft for any of these. This is uh, when we go and test uh, PayPal. They're the only ones that have PayPal software. So we find a bug in PayPal. They're the only ones that have those. So that's the, so those are the types of bugs that we're talking about here. So, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, okay. okay. Let's just take uh, PayPal as an example. Okay? Sure. Suppose uh, in five years, uh, uh, four years ago, okay, right. you found 100 bucks in okay. PayPal. Okay. And uh, then you gave a number, like each year, okay, yeah. you say 20 bucks oh, yes. okay, are introduced. Then what happens? The first 100 bucks. Oh, That's what I like. oh it's, it's cumulative. So we're the the ones that I'm I'm tabulating. It's just the ones where the where the found date was in that year. Okay. I, I'm not. I, oh, so in the case of, uh, let me go back. Oh, maybe I'll just go. I dropped out of full screen. Where's the full screen button? <laughs> Control L. Awesome. All right, so going back a little bit like those. So uh, we're only going to, in the 2007, any bugs we found in 2007 will only be counted here. Anything that we found in, anything 
new that we found in 2008, because we're testing the same sites over and over again, so we know when we found something that, was, that we didn't see was there before. So we're not, we're not double counting in that way. So actually, what, what you bring up a good point, though, is we don't, I don't have a good number for how many vulnerabilities that they did actually have in this year. <laughs> This number is interesting, but uh, what uh, the site really wants to know is uh, how many bugs I'm having. Mm -hmm. Does the total go up or go down? Right. Right. Yeah, I'm only tracking, uh, it seems I'm only tracking new instances and not up or down over time. Uh, actually, uh, it's a really good point, and I'll have to get those new numbers calculated. <laughs> Any other questions? Was it? No? Okay. All right, so I, I, we had this window of exposure, and I wanted to see if window of exposure and trended over time. Um, so I, I asked the, uh, our, our data guys to go, give me the window of exposure, same kind of chart, but trend it. And then the numbers started going the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, it would seem to me in this chart that uh, things are getting worse, but then we had a closer look at it, and it's a little bit misleading. What this chart really shows is that when we first started in the early days, these are the early adopters. And what we found later is we started to add a whole lot of n more sites to the system. So that's actually what you're seeing in the window of exposure up there. We're actually adding a whole bunch more to the system, so we're getting data bias So in, this, in the sets. So what we're having to do now is we're going to track sites that have been on the system like six months, ones that have been a year, a year and a half, two years, and see how they compare under aggressive testing. Do the sites that have been on the system one year perform differently than two years and try to figure out information on why and slice the data up that way. So fortunately, that almost gave me a heart attack. <laughs> now, uh, we've, when we find an issue, we, sh we share with our customers what type of issue it is, how bad it is if exploited, where exactly it is in the site, how to replicate it, and also, most importantly, how to fix it. Once they have that data, it's their responsibility to go code up a fix, QA it, push it to production, and where we will finally retest it. Between the point that we reported it and the point that we tested that it's actually fixed, you get a time to fix metric in days. Uh, and that's what you're going to see there on the horizontal. On the vertical is a, a cumulative website percentage. So we found this was the best way to review the data. So that's sort of the, the, the red line there, uh, the banking sector. So right here, if you go up to the top there, the 50% uh, line, 50% of banking websites fix their vulnerabilities in about 33 days or less on average. This is important for our customers because they want to know how fast they should be fixing their issues. And if they are fixing it that fast, is it good, bad, or otherwise? So you can kind of see there's a big, long tail there. <laughs> Even when you get up to, let's say, let's say the average, uh, the black line there, 50%, most websites take right around 110 days to fix an issue once reported. So <laughs> that's a little spooky, huh? Yes? This might be an inappropriate question, but how uh, detailed are the exploits that you look for? So for example, are these things that if someone who has good knowledge of security starts looking for them, they're going to find them pretty quickly? Or does your software also look for pretty complicated, intense uh, exploits? Sure. Uh, the question is, I guess, yeah, how sophisticated are these particular issues? So if you're a bad guy, you're just looking for the one, in which case uh, most websites, you know, the average bad guy can probably find an exploitable bug in probably an hour or two. Um, maybe a Google target, maybe eight to 12 hours. Um, our job is not is the attacker, yes, but our job is to find all all the time or as close to it as possible. So yeah, we're going to find both the low-hanging fruit and the golden apples, if you want to call it that way. Um, our, our automated software is not infallible, far from it. Our automated software is meant to reduce the amount of labor it takes. So we're able to do more, more of the same comprehensiveness in a less amount of time. And so we do have a, uh, a substantive amount of manual testing that we do because the Turing problem kills us every time in our work. We can't fully automate the testing of a website. We're getting better at it, but we're by no means close. Hopefully that, hopefully that answers your question. Yes? Um, are we only looking at the critical ones here, or are we also looking at less critical? These. These are, these are, in PCI terms, high, critical, and urgent. So you're not PCI compliant if you have one of these, but these will 
make you headline news, you will get data in some capacity. These are the things that you really should patch. There is no what we would consider low or things that you could ignore. So these are the bad ones. Yes, sir. So if these things are vulnerable for this large percentage of time, uh, do you believe it to be the case that your firm is the only one that knows about a lot of them until you make your customers aware? I mean, if it's a month before something gets fixed and the bad guys know about it, they're going to be relentless, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Um, we've had it. It's a, it's happening more and more often now, probably because we have more and more customers. But we've had it. We get n numerous calls now on vulnerabilities that get exploited on vulns that we already reported. Uh, that happens quite common, uh, commonly. Um, our customers, a new phenomena, our customers are starting to get blackmailed on vulnerabilities on ones that other guys would find that the other guys also found. You know, give us money for finding this issue or we'll report it and embarrass you. Um, we're, yeah, they, uh, the bad guys know. <laughs> and because and we're not the only ones that do this work. I mean, we're not the only ones that offer scanners and things like that. You can get a $500 scanner that find, will find a lot of these. You know, we just happen to do it for you. Yes. No large uh, organization is just going to apply a patch like when whenever they hear about a vulnerability, it's like has to go through an internal process and be verified that it doesn't interfere with uh, uh, existing operations. Yeah. So, do you think that like um, the higher, uh, the earlier higher cumulative percentage of uh, banking and uh, I believe, well, uh, was that telecommunications issues that are uh, that are fixed? Is that due to? Um, like higher regulation on those industries, or it could be. I, it's, uh, that's why I've, it's kind of stated up front. We have a, I, we have outcomes. We don't have inputs or controls. We don't know if they hired somebody, fired somebody, put a web application firewall, or there's a regulation mandate that came down. I had a CEO directive. They had developer training. We don't know any of those things. We just know outcomes. We have inferences. We have some anecdotal data because we work with these guys all the time. Um, what motivates the most is when the bad guys hack them. <laughs> and then policy changes real fast. Uh, what happens is in the case of regulation, it all comes down to the auditor that you get and what they're willing to tolerate. Um, you will see times where you know, there's, uh, there are companies that will game the system that will purposely disable authentication for our scanner. So we'll find nothing and they'll report nothing to the auditors that way. And to the, for the auditor, they'll say that's good because, they, because the regulations that you read technically don't say that you have to assess while authenticated. Your mileage will vary. On, on, on Compliance does not equal security, not by a long shot. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned 8 to 12 hours for a bad guy to find like a serious vulnerability in a Google app. Yeah. Why isn't Google getting more publicly compromised then? It seems that seems like it's a really low bar. Well, know? if, you, if I, I think in that the answer to that question is that if you look prior to the summer of 2010, you actually find a lot more published uh, uh, Google vulnerabilities. Uh, after uh, the summer of 2010, you actually find Google's bounty program, and they actually started paying for bugs. You know, they started paying for researchers, so they get between 500 and 3,000 bucks depending on the bug, and those are now press stories that no longer get hit. You know, so for Google, for Google and a company that has billions paying 500 to 3,000 bucks to not get press is actually a pretty good deal. And you actually see those bounty programs that's pop, uh, popping up more often. You find them at Mozilla. Uh, Facebook now has one. And there's actually a lot of other sites that uh, will pay you for their bugs. So that might be one reason. It's not to say that Google isn't getting compromised, or at least their end users aren't. All right, let's continue. So just because we found an issue and we're starting to track it doesn't mean it actually got fixed. So this is the remediation rate that we're tracking historically over time since uh, October of 2007 through September or let's say August of 2011. Another bit of good news, remediation rates are going up over time. But you can kind of see it's kind of skewed across the range by depending on industry. But the overall trend line is it seems to be going up by about 45 to 5% year over year on the average. So we're starting to fix vulnerabilities faster and more of them over time. So this is a really welcome news. We're trying to figure out how to push these numbers up even higher. Um, what we actually found is, you know, what Richard mentioned earlier, just from our from operational, how security vendors' incentives become in line with our customers. We actually find uh, we run a subscription service, and what we found is that customers who don't fix bugs tend not to renew because they don't want to pay for last year's report next year. 
So anything that we do to get them to fix bugs uh, makes it more likely for us to stay in business. So we give them all the help and guidance they possibly can to fix these issues, and that's the trend line there. The ones that come up are the ones that we started adding new verticals and kind of went, went after that one. But the banking sector does pretty good over time, uh, just stays above the trend line, the, the big red line there. All right, so we ask your customers all the time, why are you not fixing these issues? Here's the big list of uh, answers that we've gotten. Uh, no one at the organization understands or is responsible for maintaining the code. Legacy websites. Uh, development groups do not understand or respect the vulnerability. Happens all the time, especially on uh, the ones that are, let's say, clickjacking. No one really knows what that one is yet. Um, feature enhancements are prioritized ahead of security fixes. I'm going to come back to this one, but this one's huge. And this is where we're going to need a lot of help from academia. If there's one problem that, we, that the security industry does not know how to solve, it's probably the most important one. It's that one. Um, Lack of budget to fix the issues. Effective code is owned by an unresponsive third-party vendor. Happens a lot. Uh, the website will be decommissioned or replaced soon, and soon might be a year or two. Uh, risk of exploitation is acceptable, or accepted. <laughs> Solution conflicts with business use case, also known as the vulnerability is a feature. <laughs> and compliance does not require fixing the issue. Yes, we have heard these. Let me see what my next slide is, and I'll touch on that other point. All right, so why does that third one matter? Feature enhancements are prioritized ahead of security fixes. The, f the vulnerabilities that we're finding are not fixed by IT, by installing a Windows or an Oracle patch. They're fixed by a development group. That means when we work for security, it has to go up to the CISO and back down to a development manager and fixed by some developer. That means from an organizational perspective, they have a trade-off to make because development resources are not infinite. Do you continue coding on a revenue generating feature that if you don't ship will cost you money, will cost you money, or do you fix a vulnerability that may get hacked and may cost you money? And how do you come to that conclusion? How does the business decide which vulnerabilities should be fixed when? We cannot just say all vulnerabilities have to be fixed all the time. That is impossible. We cannot reach zero. So from a business economic standpoint, how do we figure out it's going to take this amount of time, we have this much risk, and it's going to cost this much in development resources versus the opportunity cost? And how do we come to a logical conclusion and be able to, I guess, justify our, our decision? In InfoSec, we have no idea. The best we can do is the bad guy might do this. <laughs> so that's the big academic question. If, and, uh, from, from, an, from, an, from an economics and business analytics standpoint, no one in InfoSec has this background. We're having to learn this stuff. Um, when five years ago, when White Hat, as we were assessing websites, we started running out of web security problems, and we started hiring uh, AI chess programmers and game theorists and things like that to find vulnerabilities, to solve problems like logging in, maintaining login state. Now we're finding more business-oriented uh, issues like that one. We want to hire more economists than anything else. We did also find that t our testing speed and frequency matters a lot. Take, given the same vulnerability, let's say a developer writes a piece of code and we get a vul a p uh, some vulnerability intelligence back to that same developer within a week of them writing that code, on the average it will take them about one man hour of work to fix that issue because the development environment is already up, they're already familiar with the code, they're already still in that you know, QA mindset, right? It takes less than one hour. You give that, take that same developer and that same vulnerability, but you don't report it to them, for, uh, to them back for a month. It actually triples the amount of effort uh, that they have to endure uh, because they have to get retasked because they're probably on a different project. They have to get their test environments back up and their check out the right source country and figure out where that code path does. It's just a lot of more boot up costs. Anything over a month, one year or more, you know, they're basically uh, two to three days uh, to get the, uh, man hours to get those issues fixed. And for all intents and purposes, that's a dif different developer fixing the vulnerability than put it in in the first place. And we're, uh, uh, we're going to find more and more, out, more and more about these particular problems here since we're starting to go into static analysis world now. We're going to start hitting source code repositories and figure out when the vulnerability is introduced and, uh, and by whom. One other theory we have is that there might be an 80-20 rule for security bugs. We think maybe 80% of the bugs are introduced by 20% of the developers. We just don't know their names yet. 
we will. <laughs> All right. And so the last concept. How are we doing on time? We got five minutes? All right. Why do breaches and vulnerabilities continue to happen? Uh, the answer is I don't think it's a technical answer. I, don't th I think we know how to fix SQL injection. We have you know, prepared statements and parameterized SQL statements. We know about input validation. We know about output filtering. We know about control. We know some vague notions of, about software development lifecycle. But I think this problem boils down to, just like I mentioned in the resources, is that there's budgeting priorities. So I'm going to ask you to play a game with me. So this is the IT budget, not IT security. This is the IT budget. This is where the business invests in IT assets. If you go ask the CFO, the one who signs all the checks, they have this big pile of money, and you separate IT assets and how the business invests in IT into applications, your software development, your, your software, your software development, your customer resource management, and all your applications, and you separate that from your hosts, your desktops, your servers, your laptops, and you separate that from your routers, switches, and network, networking components. Um, if, Maybe somebody wants to uh, take a wild guess. From an IT perspective, who gets the most money? Yes, sir. Uh, which part makes you actual money? Yeah, it, it could be. So who tends, in, from a broad industry average, just take a guess. There's probably no right or wrong. It's going to be, it's going to, it's going to go different on a company by company basis, but there are broad averages. I throw it into the applications. Applications number one. Who gets number two? Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, number two? Who gets the second most money? I will say hosts. <laughs> and the third one is that you probably spend the, the least from IT on routers and switches. So, gentlemen's right. This is where I think it goes. And I'll, I'll back this up in a moment. But the applications get the most money because you're paying for software, software developers, or your Windows stuff. And then you spend a little bit less on your your, your PC workstations, your laptops, and very, very little on your network stuff. So that's how the business invests. If you go ask the CISO, and this could be at Carnegie Mellon too, how they invest their money, because they are a subset of IT and they do budgeting as well, they need to start spending their money to protect the IT assets of the business. So who gets the most money if you're a CISO? Who gets the most money? What do you spend the most on if you're a CISO? Anyone wants to hazard a guess? Come on, come on, play along. It's all right. I'm sorry. IDS and firewall. Then uh, the the network side. Could be. So we'll advance this. So the network gets the most money. They're spending most of the money on firewalls, networks, IDS, SSL, and SSL monitoring things. They're spending second most on vulnerability management to protect the host, system configs, and patching. And they're spending very little on software architecture, training, and testing. That might be why we're sitting in my, my stats the way they are. So let's line this up. I think the biggest line item in non-security spending should match the biggest line item in security. That would make sense. I mean, we buy car insurance the same way. So, but if you look at IT, it goes one, two, three. They spend the most on applications, second on hosts, third on networks. But if you look at how IT security spends, it's actually 180 degrees out of phase. Yes, we are going to continue having these problems because this is how we spend. It's completely backwards. Now, this is just, it's one thing for me to say it, right? So let me give you some empirical data. This is a survey done uh, in 2010 of 450 Fortune 1000 companies from Fishnet Security. Nearly 70% of those surveys say mobile computing is the biggest threat to security today, closely followed by social networking and cloud computing platforms. Around 65% rank mobile computing the top threat in the next two years, and 62% say cloud, uh, cloud computing will be the biggest threat uh, bumping, social network, bumping social networks. Here's where it gets comical. The report goes on to say 45% say firewalls are their prior, prior, priority security purchase followed by antivirus and authentication and anti-malware. Can you tell, can you, do you follow the disconnect there? Which thing do firewalls protect against? <laughs> Does firewalls protect against any of the threats they, ju they just named are the most significant? Nothing. How about antivirus? Is that going to help you on your mobile computing or your cloud computing platforms? 
It is completely unbalanced. They actually do not understand yet the cognitive dis uh, forget the word cognitive dis 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 dissonance. Ugh, okay, speaking too much. Um, no amount of authentication, two-factor auth is going to protect any of this stuff. So that's one uh, anecdotal. So I'll give you one analyst report. Market sizing estimates for network security anywhere uh, range anywhere from five to eight billion dollars, whereas our calculation for the aggregate application security market is 440 million. It's about 10 percent. Despite the spending boost on application security mandated by PCI, it's still not commensurate with the uh, demonstrated level of risk. So I've just shared with you that all the breaches happen on the web applications. The web applications are riddled with vulnerabilities. And I've just showed you that all the spending is backwards. This is why you will see all the headline news and why this problem is not getting solved. Fortunately, I'm in a good industry, and we expect the revenue to grow by 23% to reach $1 billion by 2014. But I'm only going to be 20% of whatever they are by 2014. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> do you really think it's, it's accurate to say that the spending is backwards, or do you think just that the application spending is inadequate? I mean, do you think these firewalls are serving no useful purpose? It could be. So, uh, good segue, actually. Um, I think the way the spending is is because uh, computer security just happened to start in network security land. We didn't have web applications way back when, so everybody all the IT guys that turned CISOs, they actually, they just happen to be network security guys, so that's what they know. They know how to buy, and they know how to buy firewalls and set them up and configure them. So I think it's just a, it's more habitual than anything else. But that's gonna, that's actually a really good point. So here's the difficult choices that the industry has to make, that every CISO has to make, that every business has to make, is one, you reallocate resources away from firewalls, IDS, and antivirus towards application security. That's gonna be tough. I mean, basically, you have to spend less on firewalls and antivirus and more on these, these fuzzy things called AppSec, that's going to be really tough. Even tougher is going to be trying to justify new application uh, security spending in such an uh, economic condition. I'm actually, actually going to the CFO if you're a CIO and go, you know all that money I'm spending in security? It's not quite enough. Meanwhile, the business isn't making enough money. Or, of course, we can keep the status quo and the breaches continue uh, ha to happen and get worse. But as we know, uh, security is optional. But then again, so is survival. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that's actually, I think, a lot of times what we're fighting for is cybersecurity, if you want to call it cyber war, it's about economic survivability uh, more than anything else. We have nation states that are hacking our systems and grabbing all our intellectual property. If you read the news today, the, the, you remember the attacks that hit RSA and got all their, all their seed keys? They think that actually was, uh, there's 750 organizations that are all part of that, a very same attack. So imagine if you're any one of the Fortune 500, a Fortune 1,000, a middle tier business, you're actually fighting the security resources of entire countries that want what you got. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to these days online. So we have to get real smart, real fast, otherwise we're going to lose it. the most important things that we have, and that's our information assets. I'm um, happy to take other questions, but other than that, thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Rob Fluting, CERT CC. I've got a quick question for you with the AppSet, uh, App Sensor Project from OWASP. Are you familiar with that? And have you yep. seen any data of an impact from that? Not enough, but I think it has. Uh, it's going in the right direction. It's kind of yeah. It's kind of it's kind of part application firewall, part application IDS. Uh, we'd like to see it deployed way more often. Um, but those are the kind of data that we need. Those things will tell us probably not the incidents, but at least what bad guys are trying. We only have a little bit of a little bit of that. We we could really use more actuarial tables with the what the bad guys are are doing that actually works. So. Yes. Um, you listed the password they use as one of the major threats. Yeah. Um, that depend on the leaked uh, the password to be stored in plain text instead of being hashed. Yeah. Okay. So that means uh, there are still a lot of sites doing that. Oh yeah. There's tons of sites that are. Uh, Storing plain text passwords, absolutely. If you open up any getting started in development book, I mean anywhere, like getting started in Ruby or Perl or PHP, they don't ever tell you to hash the passwords. That's going to be in the second or third book that you that you read if you get that far. Um, but speaking on passwords, I think it actually now, from a general end user standpoint, I actually more advocate them writing their passwords down and putting them on a post-it note in their home office. It's much easier to secure that in the physical world than your PC now. I dare anybody to think otherwise. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it, it runs counter to everything we've been taught for the last 15 years, but the banks have basically given up over on desktop security. They're actually trying to figure out now how to do business with an end user that they know for a fact is compromised because that's more normal than anything else. <laughs> Any other questions? That was kind of the uplifting story. <laughs> so, um, do we have an idea of how many of these exploits could have been prevented with more static analysis tools at the development uh, stage? And then if it's a substantial amount, why aren't companies investing in these? Are they too expensive or you know, what's the problem? So I think from the case, I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like 12 years into dynamic analysis, so I'm more familiar in that world. Um, but static analysis, we're getting our toes in, wet in that water. But I think if any of the scanning technologies can find all the syntax issues or pretty close to it. So you take a lit, you take probably as far as number of issues, probably 75 to 80 percent of those issues off the table um, during those times. Will they invest in those or why not? That kind of goes back to do they do they see the value? Do they have the budget available? Is there awareness that that's where the problems are? Is there awareness that that 80 percent spent on firewalls isn't going to help you? So it's, a lot of times that's kind of what my one third of my job is at least, it's just building awareness around like at showing them like, I do this in my browser, I go right by your firewall and I grab all your credit card numbers. It's, and they go, oh, they never heard of that before. The RSA keynote speakers never told them. <laughs> so. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much for your time. It's been my pleasure being here.